I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello folks, this is Cinema Royale, where we keep it classy most of the time, and this is a big occasion for me and this podcast and everyone else participating. We're recording this on September 1st, 2017, might turn into September 2nd, uh, but this is our 100th episode, our 100th episode of Cinema Royale. Uh... So many years of uh, episodes, and here we are at the 100th episode here. And uh, if you don't know by now, I am your host, Mike Mixtape, and let me introduce you to the brother slash sisterhood, brotherhood slash sisterhood of cinema. First off, I miss this guy so much. He's He was on vacation, he met some friends, he talked about it on the cinema lounge, you can check that out. It's James Sullivan, also known as Jaime Dude. Uh, tonight's broadcast is brought to you by the little sour apple flavored candy that I peeled up off the floor in the cafeteria, washed it off, and then munched it on the way home. Oh! <laughs> wow. What? What? <laughs> oh, I don't think anyone's going to top that. Mm-hmm. Wait, 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 wait. You. You. Peeled it off the floor. Oh, it wasn't really stuck walking. that hard. You're gross. Oh my god. Thank you, thank you. I, I washed it off. The gentleman of the group. Yeah, but still. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and judging by and judging by its and judging by its shape, it had not been stepped on. You know that how? <laughs> because it was a hard candy. <laughs> you don't know it, where it's because been. it was a because it's not just a hard candy. It's, it's. It was also in it in its original shape and everything. I remember kids. Okay, they take candy from strangers, especially that way fuck quick. So they'll probably find it off the floor. <laughs> Want some soy sauce? And next up on the plate is my wonderful girlfriend from. England, Steph Felton. Hi. Uh, for once, I see a day and a scar and lippy on because I'm heading off to the day to go visit my sister. So, uh, so yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and last but not by least. The, by the way. Sorry, by the way, for the uh, for the American folks out there, Leicester is a place in England that is not London. Or Liverpool. Oh. <laughs> you mean it's Essex? <laughs> no! It's a two and a half car journey away, sort of in the Midlands. Oh, you mean oh, wait, wait. York? Sort of it. It... No! What's <laughs> in the north? Ah. Wales? That's a separate country altogether, you prick. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, last but not least is our favorite ginger, Cody Klusner. Uh, I did have an opening joke, but I can't top either one of those two, so let's just get started. Good, good. Let's just keep this ball rolling, because that's going off with a bang. Um, <laughs> for the 100th, I figure we just do a, a typical episode, of course, not just a big celebration or anything, uh, because I'm simple that way. Um, 
So, uh, we are doing a composer episode once again. We have already done one earlier this year with Danny Elfman. Uh, we did one a couple of years ago with our first one being James Horner. This time we're going to take a look at the works of Jerry Goldsmith. Mm -hmm. He is a legendary composer of film. Uh, he passed away in 2004 and his death date was uh, a couple of months ago so i figured why not just uh dedicate this to him and talk about his works so uh, he's uh okay <laughs> edit that <laughs> what's all that about cody <laughs> i just my mother saying good night so edit that and, and that last bit edit <laughs> Okay. I will. <laughs> Good night, Mrs. Klusner. <laughs> Good evening, Mrs. Klusner. Oh my <laughs> Mom, I'm recording a podcast. What are you doing? You recording a podcast? No, mother, no. Pod, pod. <laughs> Okay. Cody, it's lunchtime. Mom, I'm doing my show. I made snickerdoodles. Be right back. <laughs> Did somebody say snickerdoodles? <laughs> <laughs> so. <clears throat> okay. Having a good time, folks. So, uh, this is interesting because two of us, uh, picked some classics, which, uh, late 60s and s probably at least 70s, based upon what I'm thinking, and then two of us actually picked something from the 90s, so we're kind of skipping a decade for the 80s, but you know what? It's going to be worth talking about here. And, uh, let's start chronological order this time, so James has the earliest of Jerry Goldsmith composures, uh, a film... Known as Planet of the Apes? Mm-hmm. I believe we've just... Uh, stop. Uh, have we discussed Have we discussed this film in particular before on this podcast? I have a feeling we... I would be surprised if we haven't. Guess what? Hmm. We haven't. Oh, wow. No, we have not. Plot <laughs> twist! Well, not to give it away, but uh, they blew it up. Um, <laughs> is, that what also, is that also what Tim Burton did? He blew it up? Yeah. I, I, I consider that, that film to be passable. Uh, I mean, not passable as in uh, let's pass by it, but I, I give it a free pass. It's it's Burton doing a blockbuster flick, so. <laughs> Isn't that his career in general? <laughs> Not in the early days, but go on. Um, going on from that, uh, the 1968 Planet of the Apes, I, I, um, I have not seen in years, but I find it a very interesting case, especially when it comes to Jerry Goldsmith's music. Uh, the whole premise of the film is uh, we have uh, we have an, we have a group of astronauts uh, taking off into space, uh, leaving Earth behind and everything. And what they come across is uh, they they fall asleep, uh, wake up hundreds of years later due to bogus film logic. Space space time somehow equals. Wibbly wobbly tommy wimey. Possibly. We, we, yeah. <laughs> but um, like like you do, we uh, we end up on a they end up on a planet where um uh, where uh, the dominant species are apes, and we also we also have human beings uh, being treated like slaves, or pets, or animals, or what have you, subservience. And uh, the whole atmosphere of the film 
it seems it, it seems very it's uh it, it the uh the the civilization that the that the these apes have created it's very it, it's very rustic shall we say it's a it's almost um you know they have uh they have uh, villages they have they have buildings but they're all really dilapidated and sort of it, you go around outside it it looks kind of like uh, something out of the flintstones you know uh it's like a it's like a cave civilization pra- practically if if that's making any sense um jerry goldsmith's score uh, the best way to describe it for this is um, it's very it's very low key a lot of the time. I I think is the best way to describe it. If I if I had to make a, a point of comparison uh, to another another um, a score piece of his, I would have to say the Twilight Zone theme. Which uh, I was actually able uh, was actually uh, pleasantly able to revisit this uh, this past trip or so. And Dad, you don't want to come around here in your underwear because we're recording. <laughs> okay. <laughs> here you go. Another edit. No, another cut, okay. You can do a lot of cutting. Another cut right there. Wait, who, who was wandering around in their underwear? Wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> That's my dad off screen. Say hello, dad. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> hello. Um. Okay, okay. Yeah. Continue. <laughs> so, like I was, as I was saying, um... The other point of comparison is the Twilight Zone, which I had the honor of revisiting this past weekend. Uh, a couple of episodes of it, and if you listen, if you listen to the to the theme of the Twilight Zone, it, it's it's minimalist. You know they they do have a they do have a set of instruments, uh, horns. Uh, a guitar that comes in, uh, famously going, do 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 But mm. it's, it doesn't feel like a full, it doesn't feel like a, a full score. And it's just, um, it's just a few instruments in a, in a small, uh, setting, uh, put together for, uh, put together for the sake of building up the tension of the show, which, mm. if you listen to the main title of the theme for Planet, the, the main title track for Planet of the Apes, you get you get a very similar feel to it, uh, in the sense that they're building up suspense, um, and the uh, by using a, a very minimal score and preferably a, a minor key. Um, and I find that ironic because Planet of the Apes is pretty much an extended Twilight Zone episode from the get-go. Mm-hmm. You you have to you, you have to take that into consideration, especially since Rod Serling, the creator of the Twilight Zone, was one of the writers on the on the on the film it the whole the whole plot and the direction everything goes it's very much especially with the twist at the end it's very much on par with the with uh, something that the twilight zone would have done and um it doesn't the score though doesn't stay minimal it uh, there are there are a lot of tracks in there where when the action in the movie kicks up, so does so does the score, 
uh, preferably, but it's also the the scoring is very non-traditional. You know, there's no, there's nothing, shall we say, uh, whimsical or or toned back about it when it when it kicks off. It's instead, it feels just very chaotic. If you take that, if you take that same, uh, that same bit of um, that that same uh, bit of minimalism that that's in the the title score, speed it up, spread it across several instruments, you get something that that's got that's got a lot of crashes and and snaps, and it it's somehow all staying within within the same key, but you got but you got uh, melodies that come and go it's uh, it's hard to to vocalize exactly what's going on it's like it's like there's a it's like there's a a, a pack of stray alley cats running across keyboards in a in a a sound studio somewhere, <laughs> but they all somehow manage to stay in the same key. <laughs> that's uh, that's the best way I can describe the the score, and I think it's a good way to. I think it's a good a good method of uh, keeping up the tension. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Can anyone else vouch for me? Can anyone else? Uh, has anyone else seen the movie here? Yes, but not recently. Not recently. Uh, I saw Planet of the Apes the musical. On oh. like The Simpsons. Oh, oh, how that say? I like this? That's real? Yeah, all I I mean all I can Oh, I was about to say that, you know, it was like, whilst James was doing the, uh, you know, like, just saying about the film, all I got going from here is da 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 So, I do have the legacy collection of the original Planet of films. I was going to research it for this episode, but I did not have the chance to watch it. So I'm sorry about that. I do it on a DVD, so I will watch it uh, in my own time, whenever. But I, with Jerry Goldsmith, I, I kind of see a pattern like that in all of his movie composures. Actually, like it's not just Planet of the Apes. You notice that, in, like we'll talk about this in up the other films, but there's just it's very minimal. It's very, um, like you said, it's just. You don't hear it as often, but sometimes when it does happen, it comes with a, like a clash, and it's like there, a very dramatic kind of way. Um, it's very like epic, I should say. It's epic kind of sounding, you know, depending on the situation. Well, well it doesn't. It it's not a. It, it's it it's not a a judgment to cast across all of his scores. I mean, if you, uh, as a point of comparison, I think of Sink of Secret of Nim. Uh, particularly the tracks where they, you know, they're trying to make a, they're trying to make um, a very whimsical uh, fantasy score uh, for that particular film, and what comes out is actually something that James Horner would do, ironically enough. Um, the the um, I I also kind of wonder this much about it uh the reason why they made a part of the reason why they made the movie the way that they did uh or in the in the um in the universe that they created with the you know with the eight villages and whatnot was because of the budget that they had to work with they they didn't want to go over budget uh they probably did that with some of the with some of the later films in the series, but mainly with this one, uh, they had a set budget. And when you look, 
uh, when you read uh, when you read up on the backstory of it, yes, it was based on a book. Uh huh. Which which I have not read, but I have but I have done some research on it in my spare time and my curiosity, and we have a we have a, almost a completely different story there. We have two different planets. We have an the the planet with the ape civilization on it, as opposed to the human civilization. Uh, it's not some it's not some uh, backwards sort of bushman looking on the on the outside village. They have they have entire cities, skyscrapers. Um, it's very much like the ending to the Tim Burton movie. Oh, spoiler alert! Sorry. Um, <laughs> and so, if it kind of makes me wonder, if they made the movie like that, would that have an effect on the score? And I say that because, um, uh, because the the minimalism of the score in in the film used is it. It sort of emulates this. It sort of emulates this uh, this very Stone Age like feel almost. If if that makes any makes any sense, if we if we have a a different movie altogether where everything takes place in a in a sprawling uh, in a sprawling cityscape that. That usually typically calls for a much bigger, a much bigger orchestra, a much bigger, much bigger feel. Mm-hmm. And they might all together. They might, you know, try and make it sound sort of futuristic in a way as well. Possibly, um, if it's set in that way. But. He actually Jerry did come back to the franchise. Actually, he actually did the music for Escape from Planet of the Apes. Um, the second film, the third film. Oh, 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 oh! Right, right, right. I have all the I have all the memories in my head of the of the series as a whole, but I can't for the life of me. Uh, keep track of the different titles. Yes, yes, yeah. He, uh, they, yeah, he came back for the third one. Hmm. And that one, I, I don't remember the score too much, but I, I do remember it being a little bit more, especially with the, with the title stuff, is a little bit more. A little bit more typical, shall we say, 70s. Right. Uh, oh, it's in that movie. Okay. Hmm? It's, okay, I'm just reading the plot of the third movie. I know what it is now. Okay. Yes, it's the one where Cornelius and his wife travel back in time uh, uh, to modern time and, and give birth to give birth to Caesar, essentially. Uh, thus setting off the chain of events uh, in the... Uh, thus setting off the chain of events uh, dictated earlier on in the series. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Yeah, that's... Okay, yeah. I guess I it's really... a bit more of a comedy, actually, than some of the other films... Any, uh... Yeah, involved eight looks like when she's shit faced. That's fun. Mhm. Mm uh, so, uh, anything you wanna recommend when it comes? Or not recommend, but like, any uh, final thoughts on the Planet of the Apes score? Or no? That's really that's really about it. Okay. I. That's fine. I think um, it it is it is what it is, and it worked. So, uh, we'll just go into the next one, which, uh, Cody has, which is The Omen. 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Ah. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, this is the one with Live Schreiber, right? I believe. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't think so. No. Yeah. Oh, right. That was the remake. <laughs> Bastards. Evil. But yeah, moving on. My lovely We'll remake this movie so we can release it on the date of 060606. Ha 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 ha. Scary thought, scary fact. That was the day of my sister's 18th birthday. So much sense is made. <laughs> but moving on from worlds conquered by apes and their interspecies love. <clears throat> hmm? uh, we have a world conquered by possibly Satan child. Yes, in the third and final of what I like to call the Devil Child trilogy. Devil Child hmm. trilogy, including Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, and The Omen. Uh, Carrie and the, the Fury don't fit in there? Yeah. But yes, uh, oh. yes, yes, never man. mind. Go on. 1976. Six. Get it? Jerry Jerry Goldsmith will actually go on to do a score that would earn him his only Emmy Award, actually. Mm hmm. And of course, anyone who knows this knows that the one song, Ave Santini, or Santini, I don't know, I don't speak. Roman or Greek, wherever the hell this is. I'm not that religious. But anyone knows Fair this enough. But anyone knows this movie, know what it's about. You know, two parents are in fact raising the Antichrist. And the score that Jerry Goldsmith gives is, well, he has to say, you know, offense, a step above of what he gives. Kind of A step above clickety clack clackety what? Yeah, apparently so. <laughs> you with us, Steph? Yes. All right. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm with you. Well, any well, anyway, apart from having a jar disturbing, basically the most Satanist song ever made that starts in the opening credits. It does. Noon delight. <laughs> Close. <laughs> but uh, the music throughout this entire movie is, mm, seems to say, it, it sums up the movie itself. Because, yes, of course, it has, uh, like I said, Avanti Sant, uh, Ave Santini, or whatever it is is the opening number, and it just sucks you in immediately to, like, yeah, this shit's gonna get real, it's gonna get scary. Leave while you can. I mean, it wasn't, like, this movie's not borderline with what The Exorcist did to people in theaters, but, you know, I think it's a good companion altogether. Mm-hmm. And, like I said, it does have some dark moments, like, a good use of strings and basically, whenever something, you know, evil is about to happen, you're like, okay, things are going to get real. But then again, on the opposite side, you know, in the early parts of the film where the mother and father are like, oh, everything's good, everything's happy, it does have a bit of, I'm going to say, a bit of whimsy to it. A bit whimsical. It's like, okay, does Spielberg have a hand in this? What, what's going on here? It could work out. We could have a, we could have a demon child and... <laughs> and things might work, you know. Yeah, he's the Antichrist. There's got to be some liability in that, you know, maybe free parking or something. Uh, <laughs> but, free booze and hookers. Uh, <laughs> Total world domination. You know, sky's the limit. But as the movie goes on and the father pay, father figure played by Gregory Peck slowly figures out okay I am the father I am the adopted father of the devil child it slowly works this way like yeah huh 
like it's all becoming real to him. He's like, it's all been a plot. It's all been some sinister, evil Satanism going on in your life. Your wife, your nanny, everything bad has happened to you is because of your five-year-old child. Go kill him, please. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's... Go ahead. Yeah, that's, uh... That's that's pretty much uh, that's pretty that's pretty much uh, the dis- the disturbing niche of the of the of the film in particular. I never really, I I respect the Omen for mm. for the story that it was trying to tell and whatnot. I never really got into it though. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you look at it, it's all basically the whole movie is like one big setup, you know, for when Damien later in the sequels, Five Act Two and Three, which Goldsmith actually composed music for. You see him rising to his power in the sequels. The first one's just like the first act, the setup. Mm-hmm. Oh, but if I had to nitpick about the music, and there is one scene in particular. It's after Damien's nanny hangs herself at his birthday party, and Damien's looking over at the basically the devil dog. Out of nowhere, and this never comes up again. It's this weird synthesized heartbeat music, and I'm sitting there going, "What the? What is this? You, you gave us an awesome opening number, and you're gonna follow it up with this? What happened here? What, what is this? Did you, did you, you still have that cat on that synthesizer keyboard? What's going on? It's my, it's my uh, John Carpenter side coming, coming <laughs> back to haunt the movie. <laughs> One way to forget. Oh. Um. But I would have to say this movie, along with itself, is probably the strongest piece of music that Goldsmith probably ever composed throughout his entire career. But that's just one person's opinion. Oh yeah. Uh, the opening bit. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Well, actually, that was also nominated Emmy for best original song, but never got it. And if it's just it fits the movie, it just it fits the movie apart from the synthesizer, which still doesn't make any sense. The whole score actually fits the movie perfectly. Mm-hmm. From the chorus, from the chorus numbers, it and the strings, it just feels like a dark, sinister movie. Highly enjoyable. Highly enjoyable. Well, I may revisit it at some point. But if I were to talk about the sequels, the opening number for the second one confuses the hell out of me because it sounds something like I have a James Bond film. And why is Damien full-on British? Uh, that's because uh, that's because his father is the U.S. ambassador in England, and Damien was raised there as a child, so technically it fits. I mean, look at Lord of the Rings. They spent two years in New Zealand, and they came back home still talking with accents. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, I, uh, that was the one. That was the one part that that never really sat with me completely. As that okay in the first movie, he's raised up until a certain age by Gregory Peck, so you think he would. He doesn't even talk. Hmm. And how old is he in the movie? About five. Five? Yeah. Yeah. So, what? what's wrong, kid? <laughs> well, his father, again, is an ambassador, so he's away a lot, and he stays home with the nanny, who looks like an evil, creepy Mary Poppins-type woman. Mm-hmm. So, it didn't, you know, either way, you're, it, it, it didn't really sort of make sense to me in the, in the sequel. Suddenly, he starts talking out of the blue, and well, he's he doesn't just talk; he talks frequently. Oh, well, yeah. Well, plus, he goes from being he goes from being completely silent uh, to talking all the time, all the time, all the time. And um, his his transition over to realizing he's the Antichrist and suddenly just owning up to it. Mm-hmm. I thought it was funny as hell. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I saw. I mean, the the sequel. 
Although I mean, Noir kind of is my favorite out of the trilogy. I don't count four, and I don't count the remake. But the second one is my personal favorite because of that factor. Damien coming of age and realizing, yeah, you're the son of Satan, dude. You're going to have to hurt some people and rule the world. At least till Jesus comes again for the second time. And on, and that... and, and on a note about him being British, fun fact, British voices make the best villains. Look at the previous movies we've had in the past couple of years. Loki, I don't know, Steph, can you, uh, <laughs> uh, can you, uh, can you back that up? <laughs> British makes good villains. Uh, there is that stereotype, the fact that you always have British people play the villain, but... I don't know. Yeah. I'm British, but I'm not evil. I'm cute and cuddly. Exactly. So British can can be can go both ways, I guess. Yeah, and they could be CP bunnies too. And the um, movie is the second movie before it did inspire one of the greatest heavy metal albums of all time. <laughs> what is that? The number two beast? Yes. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, Jerry Goldsmith did the whole trilogy of movies. Like, interesting. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I just I look back on the on the second one. I didn't really find it frightening. No. I, again, only because yeah. only because they pushed the uh, they forgot to they forgot to be subtle when they needed to be. But the hilarity comes in near the end of the film. I I just remember I just remember this uh, 10 12 year old Damien uh, realizing he's the antichrist and sucking it up and suddenly he's he's surrounded by girls <laughs> all, all of all of his own age preferably of course but he's just he's just kind of like sitting around like yeah I'm the mac daddy I'm a, I'm a middle school mac daddy because of this I'm the son of satan yeah <laughs> Okay. Uh, it's more comedy than they than they gambled for, I think, in the long, in the long run. <laughs> but that's my dealio. <laughs> definitely something to check out. Oh, oh well, definitely. Okay. Yes. So, okay. So, so we're gonna skip uh, a couple of decades, going to straight to the nineties. Um, I wanted to choose this because, uh, in the James Horner episode, I chose a Schwarzenegger film that he did, and I was like, ooh, Jerry Jerry Goldsmith did a Schwarzenegger film, and I was like, okay, Total Recall, Total Recall, mm. from 1990. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's one of the best one of the best philip k dick adaptations like i'm i'm a huge fan of philip k dick he's one of my favorite authors he's a great sci-fi writer um so it is based on one of his short stories uh total recall is directed by paul verhoeven who did robocop previously uh so jerry goldsmith did the square of this and this actually people say this is probably his most popular and best score he's done in recent years uh so because total recall it's interesting because i was watching it and the way it plays out in the movie it's it, you don't hear the score all the time the, there's some quiet moments in the mm -hmm. movie so there'd be like moments where you see some f action scenes or there'd be like quiet moments and there's no score whatsoever the score pops up to like uh, move the kind of the story along, I guess, or the plot, I guess. It shows um, it shows up during like a, a chase scene or something, you know, just to get the ball rolling. It's really like tense, you know. It'll show it goes up and down, like it, it'll be tense, 
it'll be like moody it'll be like depending on what the mood is it goes through every emotion it's like you're on this roller coaster ride and the music shows you that going up and down up and down up and down and it actually mixes like uh orchestrated uh pieces with like electronic as well so there's like a little synth in there in the background with all the strings as well which has got a good combination um like i was like expecting the score to go throughout the whole movie and i was like oh wow this is actually pretty different because you don't hear it all the time the quimo is you know you actually hear the the punches or the kicks when arnold schwarzenegger gets you know fighting mode um total recall if you don't know what it is it's a very compelling sci-fi story actually it um this is like a, a movie that will test your uh brain a bit because uh you don't know you may or may not know depending on which side you're on like it's like there's a point where uh our switch player plays this construction worker and he's uh wants to go on mars so he goes to recall where they implant memories and there's uh there's an ego trip where you can actually play as as somebody else like you can be a playboy you can you know be a secret agent so he's like oh, i want to be a secret agent while on mars so he gets implanted and then everything goes awry and it's like he's in the secret agent mode and there's a conspiracy behind it there's this thing about mars and you don't know whether some people say you know some people say he's dreaming some people say he's not dreaming so it's just this compelling kind of story where it keeps you guessing till the end, that they, whether he's dreaming or not. And even, and even the way it ends, uh, people will will probably still say, yeah, maybe he's not dreaming. Exactly. Or maybe he is dreaming. It, it's it, still up for debate. It, exactly, and that's what makes it a really good movie because it's just, it's it, it keeps you guessing. Like there's there's actually one point in the movie where. Uh, there is a sign that you could say, oh, he's not dreaming, but at the end, it's like, oh, maybe he is dreaming. So, um, score actually does, like, uh, influence that in a way. It gives you all the emotions, like, you know, when somebody, uh, you know, if there's a heartfelt moment, you know, it'll kind of go moody there, like a set, or if it's like, uh, some whimsical kind of sound when he's looking at something and it's like whimsical in a way it's like ah, ha, 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 in a way sort of it's like it's it's a score that's definitely worth listening to because uh you don't hear a lot of scores that kind of mix orchestrated with um uh electric music synth, synth a little synth in there which I thought, thought was pretty cool, because mostly they go with one way or another. But this Jer Jerry makes us both together, and it sounds really good, actually. So, um, for the movie, I just love, because Schwarzenegger is the best in this. Like, he's got the great greatest one-liners in here. He's just, he's just having a good time in this movie. And the special effects in this movie are just... Because this movie at the time was the most expensive, like, production out there, because the special effects alone... Which still hold up magnificently. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. Uh, shall we say two weeks? <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> it is so... I, I can't... I, I've... I've only seen it all the way through maybe once or twice, so I can't really I can't really comment on the on right. the score too much. That's fine. But yeah, there this is probably one of the earlier instances in which uh, they did the sort of thing that you're that you're talking about. Either yeah, if you're if you're on the John Carpenter side of scoring, you're pretty much set with your your synth all all the way through almost unless you add in drums, then it's up for it's up for some changing. But at the same time, yeah, orchestral. Yeah, how many how many times can you can you think of uh, of a time where um, they mix in an orchestral an orchestral score with say something more contemporary like a hip hop beat? 
The only time that I can think of that happening actually is in the film uh, At World's End. Because there's one because there's one fight scene in the movie where they have the the hip hop song uh, playing in the background uh, 30 seconds to comply. And it's so perfectly blended in with the the speed of the score, the music that at one point they just sort of mesh together and you're like, "Wow, how did that how did that work so perfectly together?" Uh, to build the tension. Uh, it's yeah. a, I think that's an example of what you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's meld pretty nicely because you hear like there's it's a lot of strings. It's not they're not like so many horns per se. There might be some drums in the back, but there's like there's strings. There's definitely like a synth sound to it. So you gotta have that mix between in certain certain parts of the movie. You hear that definitely throughout the whole score. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like that. It was like pretty cool. It's like it's like you know t- trying to be like this epic kind of adventure kind of score, but yet you have this futuristic kind of sound because it's set in twenty uh, twenty forty eight, I believe, in the future, something like that. I... Mm. All the good things happen in twenty forty eight. Man, it's just... Oh, 31. Matt. Just, I just love the movie. I just do it. It's, it still holds up. It's really good. It's Schwarzenegger's like at his best in this movie. And it's another movie featured in this podcast, which was completely butchered by a remake. Yeah. It does not which gave me. us PG-13 boobies. Ugh. It, it makes no sense to even put her in the remake, too, because... They just did that for fan service, really. Mm. It, it just... I mean, well, sort of, because it kind of tied... Well, I don't know. It's... Uh, I don't... Freaking remake... Ugh. Blah. I hate that so I much. wouldn't know about it. I watched it. <laughs> no, it's just... It's horrible. It doesn't even... It doesn't even... It's not even set on Mars. That's the thing. That's all on Earth. It's, yeah, that's the whole... That's the book itself. And you have Colin Farrow playing the part, not freaking... Mm. With the original 90, 1990 film, it just... Schwarzenegger just goes, like, in full, like, Schwarzenegger mode. It's like, you blowed my cover! Ah! Yeah! Yeah! Mm-hmm. Some of the best Schwarzenegger faces can be found in this film. So many fake even a, <laughs> even the fake ones. Yeah. Oh, you can. I mean, you can tell the effects, but it kind of works how they play out. Like when they uh, get exposed to Mar to Mars, you know, and then the face goes, the eyes bulge out. It's like, whoa, that that will probably happen if you did that on Mars. <laughs> Your face goes. Bleh. I don't know. I don't know. Ask Matt Damon. <laughs> yeah, can we get verification from the le- uh, from the last person who visited Mars? Oh man, yeah. I mean, you got other key players in the film too. You got Michael Ironside. You've got Ronnie Cox in it. Um, even the th- in the iconic. Three boobed lady. Because <laughs> mm. in the future, mutants will uh, rise and there be one mutant with three breasts. Well, I don't know if she was actually a mutant. Just I feel like she, had... I feel like she was because, mind you, the portion of the film takes place in Venusville on Mars, and that's a town full of mutants. Okay, but but answer me this: How many uh, mutant hookers did you see in that movie? Most of them were just walking up and saying, "Let me tell you your future." Not here, are my boobies. Play with them. It was very the the the, the place called Last Last Call, I believe. Um, last was, resort. Last resort. Thank you. Uh, was very subtle for a place like that. It was just like because she was there, like at the bar, and you know, I was like, "Let's play with these." 
And then uh, there's that one that he meets up for the rest of the film. And then, and there's that, <laughs> there's that little, little, uh, little kind of hooker that is like, I'll take along if if you need some help with that. But she wasn't a mutant, but she was just. <laughs> mm-hmm. I didn't want to say the other term, but there was a little one. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cute. Um, yeah, the, yeah, it's kind of a mixture between mutants and humans. Like, there was, you could see there's definitely deformed, like, mutants, like, psychics. There's a lot of psychics in there. Like, it's just a wonder when you look at the film, like, so many things going on for it. Indeed. Well, I wonder how we're going to get to the fourth and final film now on the podcast. Steph. <laughs> Steph. I know, Sleepy Bunny. It's your Sorry. Turn. It's your turn, Sleepy Bunny. Okay. Okay. Just get yourself composed a little bit. Now remember the topic. It's Dom Deloise. Let's go. <laughs> Dom Deloise. Sure. Let's yes, talk. you pick. Let's talk about going bananas. Fire away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. I didn't quite watch this film, but I have seen this film in my childhood. <laughs> And, um, this is the Milan. Oh? And... That was a goldsmith? Yeah. Yeah, Milan was a goldsmith. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Mulan. Mulan. Uh, right. Not Mulan Rouge, Mulan. Okay. I, I have very negative feelings against Mulan. Oh, no offense. Mm? When you share a room with a kid brother, and when it's his turn to pick a movie to watch to go to bed with, and it's constantly Mulan, you learn to hate it a bit. I'm a bit yeah. resentful. Uh... Mm. Well, this was the first film my sister saw in the cinema. And... I mean, it's a good film, but it's not like one of my absolute favorites, but you know. Um, but Jerry Goldsmith does do a really good job in this. Like, um, I tried to listen to the whole soundtrack, but I couldn't find it on YouTube. So, I tried to kind of listen to, like, bits of the score and how his score kind of plays a part in the songs. And, in a way, um... Sorry, um, in a way, the songs, like, his music in there, like, the orchestral score, he definitely has a really good blend of, like, the Asian influence and, you know, a big orchestral score, like, You know, you've got songs like Reflection and, and you've got like the the Asian influence in there and I feel there's something about uh, there's something about it that, that feels slightly oriental especially with uh, especially with the songs I think, um, what, was, what was the name of the song they sing when they when they go to the to visit the matchmaker. Please bring honor to us oh, all. That's the one. Honor to us all. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, and then you've got songs like uh, "Make a Man Out of You." That's more kind of orchestral than actually the Oriental um, influence. But the songs are still really great. I can't remember who wrote the songs, but um, one of the best scenes um, that's a great example for 
the score that Jerry Jerry Goldsmith. Gold, <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. Jerry Goldsmith does. Um, is the transformation scene? Oh, oh yeah. But, but it starts off so subtly, and then you you know when Milan's made up her mind that she's gonna go to war. When, like, the Asian influence. Well, actually, there's any Asian influence throughout that scene, but like when it really kind of hits home, and it just like boom there. But it keeps. Oh, when it she's still. cutting her hair and everything. Yeah, it keeps, yeah, what you keep, like, ugh, it keeps a steady pace, you know, but it moves the scene along really well. Yeah, I think, I think I know the sequence in which you're talking about. I remember reading something years ago uh, with this particular film where they, they tried to, they were trying to, to keep the pacing uh, of the of the scene and the pacing of the music in sync with each other. And I, I don't, and I remember sitting back and watching the movie the first time, and I was trying to figure out what that meant exactly. Like, the, does she, is she, is she stepping to the beat of the, to the beat of the music by by any chance? No, that's not particularly what it is. But she's, but the way that it's edited especially it's very on key with the music and uh, and that's that's what sort of makes that scene in particular stand out mm -hmm. I know this doesn't have anything to do with the score but I do like the grandma character in there especially at the end where it's like ooh sign me up for the next war and I was like, would Thank you like to stay for dinner? Or would you like to stay forever? <laughs> Thank you, June, for a... Yeah. Oh, yes. Rest in peace. But yeah, um... Yeah, that's really uh, all oh. I have to say, because, like, I didn't get a chance to kind of, um, watch the film. See. Um, but, you know, I kind of did what I could with research. See... And here's mm -hmm. the thing. Here's the thing too, because uh, he also does the same thing here in Milan. Actually, he does the same thing that he did in Total Recall. He kind of mixed orchestrated score with uh, heavy synth synth music as well. So I guess later. Really? Is, yeah, um, there is hints of synth in uh, in the or orchestrated pieces in the film. Um, it's not like like 80s kind of synth it's like very contemporary kind of synth song to it um so i guess so i guess in the later career of jerry goldsmith he would kind of mix and meld this for a while especially in a couple of films not all the films but like a couple of as example like that. so that's something i noticed when listening to it i was like oh yeah um but actually it's kind of, it's kind of interesting actually reading up on the like the the history of the soundtrack really because they were trying to find people to compose the Mulan film and uh, and uh, they considered Denny Elfman, Thomas Newman, um, Rachel Portman to compose, but Portman was uh, became pregnant during production, decided to back out, and uh, there's even uh, what is this, Randy. Eld Eldman, who did uh, the uh, Dragonheart soundtrack, because the Dragonheart. Oh yes. Because the Dragonheart theme was actually used in the trailer, um, was considered, um, but then Jerry Goldsmith was available, side on. So, a lot of people were like dropping out and coming in and out. So it was kind of interesting that Jerry Goldsmith wasn't the first pick though for the. For the thing even though his uh his credits uh outweigh most of those people oh yeah oh for sure oh, yeah. i mean if you look at other goldsmith uh composed films and tv projects it's gonna blow your mind because like i said he's a legend in the business and 
you know, you, you look at all the years he's been doing it, and it's like, oh, I've seen that, and that, and that. And it's like, now you've experienced a lot of Goldsmith in your life. I mean, James mentioned The Secret of Nim, you know, Don Bluth film, you know, it's like, that's part of your childhood, you know, oh, that Goldsmith did that, I mean, there's other films out there that he did it as well, um, for example, there's, like, Logan's Run, came out the same year as The Old Men, Alien, he did Alien, really Scott's Alien, 79. How funny is that, I recently saw Logan's Run. Oh well. <laughs> it's like, oh wait. Jerry Goldsmith, what are you doing here? Um, he's done I... the, he's done the first Blood Rambo films, you know. He did Supergirl, like in, in the eighties, he did quite a bit. Um, funny enough, oh, he yeah. actually, funny enough, James, he actually did the score for King Solomon's Mines. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> got it. Psh. Um, and uh, if he worked for those guys. Uh... Uh, from what we saw before, chances are, uh, chances are he worked with a twelve-piece orchestra, and had it re-recorded over on top of itself to sound like a twenty-four-piece orchestra. <laughs> he did Gremlins. Um, he did Cycle Two. Yeah. Um, that was a, that was a good sequel. Oh yes. Um, oh, the film that you want to show me, Inner Space. Oh he boy! Mm -hmm. um, he always oh, he's, he's been known actually known for Star Trek too as well. He's actually composed a lot of Star Trek uh, films, I believe, and TV shows. Yep, he did the Star Trek motion picture soundtrack. He did uh, uh, the Next Generation theme. Mm -hmm. He did five, the Final Frontier. Dear God. Um, <gasps> so he's done a lot, like. Even Dennis the Menace in the 90s. He did that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so he's... I done... remember that. Oh, yeah, so if you're a big Star Trek fan, he's done a lot of Star Trek stuff. He did the Voyager theme, he did the First Contact, um, Insurrection, he did The Mummy, yeah, The Mummy in 1999. Um, and then, yeah... Before his death, his, in the 2000s, he would do films like Hollow Man, Nemesis, Star Trek Nemesis. And actually, one of his last composing projects was Looney Tunes Back in Action. Yes. Oh, he did that? Yeah. Oh, wow. He has a wide range when it comes to films. There's no doubt about that. Oh, he does. Like, mm -hmm. Very much. He's a legend in the composing business. I mean, a lot of composers go you know look up to him so i mean we, we've really talked about at least four of them here and you know and you know this guy should be remembered and this guy should be you know and you need to watch these films and watch tv shows you know like he, like james said he did the twilight zone you know show and composing music you know he's just a legend so uh so yeah um that's basically it, really, because uh, when it comes to music, here's the thing. When it comes to music, it's really hard to like talk about it. And this is why we do these episodes, to challenge yourself, you know, to actually talk about the music of a movie, you know, because it's, you know, scores and soundtracks are just, you know, a part of movie making. Uh, well, we only have two people in this particular group who are musically inclined. Don't judge me. The rest, of you, the rest of you guys are listeners. You're welcome, Steph. Yeah. Um, no, but that's the difference, though. That's the that's the good thing because that's a good thing because people can talk like people who know music and do music can hear things that listeners can't hear, you know, or understand music otherwise. So that's the difference between people. So. Um, uh, please leave a comment below or maybe I'll do another poll for you guys to tell you uh, which composer we should do next on the podcast because um, that just keeps on like, getting interesting and listening to the soundtracks more 
Um, thank you for listening and watching. If you've been watching this podcast over the years and you've reached to this episode, thank you for listening and watching. Please subscribe for more episodes. I we will reach a hundred more episodes, people. We will go to two hundred now. That's our goal now. To go go to two hundred, hopefully. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... <laughs> If, they, the next if, 100. if the if they've been listening all this time, shouldn't they already be subscribed? Hey, touche, <laughs> touche. I'm talking about the people. So yeah, I'm talking about the people who are just discovering this episode and seeing that red box down below. There's a red box that says subscribe. If they've not clicked on that, that means they have not subscribed yet. Also, click the little bell icon so you can get notifications yes. when the next podcast will be up. Yes, you will get a email directly saying, Mike Mixtape has uploaded a video, and it'll be right in your inbox, and you can click on it and watch the episode directly. Um, so yeah, you check out James Sullivan, check out Cody Klusener, check out Steph. I will, I will try to link everybody's social and YouTube so you can subscribe and follow them wherever and uh, next time on the podcast we'll be uh, looking over biographical films films that are about a person or a group of people based on real life based on a person so a life story basically so pick a uh, biographical movie to discuss in two weeks two weeks Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> Two weeks. We should be weak. Thank you for listening and watching. See you in the next episode. Mm hmm. And ciao for now. Later.